<coughs> excuse me. Uh, welcome to development, which is section 27 of 2402 lab. This first image here is kind of complicated, but don't uh, get buried. It's it's got a nice summary of everything, and we're going to start right over here. See what I'm circling? So those that's ovulation occurring right there. So that's when the the uh, the secondary oocyte is released from the ovary. Then it be, that follicle becomes this guy, which is the corpus luteum. We learned about that in the previous uh, chapter. So this structure right here now represents that uh, ovulated uh, secondary oocyte. Uh, there's a couple of thing, features around the outside. There's this these spiky looking things called the corona radiata. You don't have to know that, but you do have to know the zona pellucida, which is, in this case, it's this little orange kind of line around here. And that's one of the barriers that keeps uh, the sperm, sperm cells out uh, and, and other objects out. So they have to get it has to get melted basically by the acrosome, which is that en uh, enzymatic head on the sperm cells. So if you look at the next little frame right here where you have the sperm cells kind of attacking the city here, uh, see, this, see this little guy right here, this little yellow guy? Well, that, that guy made it through. You can see that he's kind of punched through that zona pellucida. The egg takes some steps after that to uh, ensure that only one sperm cell gets in. You don't want more than one sperm cell. You want one sperm nucleus, one egg nucleus. That'll return you back to your uh, diploid state of uh, 46 chromosomes. So here's this, in the third thing, sperm nucleus, egg nucleus, they fuse. And now you've got a diploid organism. It starts to divide. These first divisions here are, they called them cleavage. That was the first name they gave them. And uh, they go two cell, four cell, eight cell, 16 cell, uh, and they start uh, just doubling. The cells produced through these first couple of divisions are called blastomeres. So this is a blastomere and this is a blastomere. All four of these are blastomeres. Uh, doesn't matter where it stops. I'm not going to go. It's a 72 hour embryo got blastomeres. Just know that those first cells are called blastomeres. As that doubling continues, you eventually get an embryo stage called a morula. And this is that uh, solid ball of cells, so it's all the way through, right? Now in humans, or mammals I should say, uh, you're going to have the next stage from Morula called a blastocyst, and so this whole thing you can call a blastocyst. What you want to see here is that there, it's definitely not a uh, uh, evenly, you know, distributed mass of cells. The cells are mostly concentrated up here and there's kind of a ring of cells around here called the trophoblast, which is that kind of outer cell mass. That trophoblast is going to be kind of the first thing that contacts the uh, uterus, which you can see occurring right here. And uh, this, at this point, you're, you've got an embryo that's implanted. That's what that process is called. It's called implantation. And uh, we'll move on to the next screen here. Uh, now, it looks like we kind of made a dramatic change here. There's this uterus and all these different developing embryos that go around here. And then I go to this thing. Well, this guy right here is that same embryo that we saw at the end of the last thing. This is that recently implanted embryo. This stage is called the bilaminar embryo or bilaminar em uh, uh, embryonic disc. And it consists of two basic layers, right? And you've seen these in your lab book already, the epiblast and the hypoblast. The epiblast uh, is the one that goes on to become the embryo, and uh, it also becomes the amnion and the allantois, or allantois. Got to look that up, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. The hypoblast becomes the yolk sac and the chorion. So those two structures, the epiblast and the hypoblast, uh, become these four what they call extra embryonic membranes. That's what these guys are, and the epiblast becomes the embryo and the three uh, what they call germ layers that that the embryo develops as it uh, continues developing. The next image, the one on the right over here, kind of represents the next stage. So this is that stage called gastrulation. So this this disc right over here on the right represents a uh, a gastrula. Now it doesn't look like this the, star, the starfish gastrula. It's a lot more complicated. There's a lot more going on. But gastrulation is still, nonetheless, if you kind of see these little arrows pointing into this little crevasse here, so this little crevasse 
represents what they call the primitive streak, and that's an old name that was given to it. Um, but what it really is is it's an invagination that is forming that uh, pocket of tissue within the embryo that becomes your uh, uh, digestive system, and it also marks the spot where later you're going to have the neural tube, you're going to have neuralation occur, and neuralation is the process where you get a um, the, the nervous system uh, developing. All right, those extra embryonic membranes I promised to talk to you about, here are the, the four of them listed on the left, the chorion, the uh, amnion, the allen trois, and the yolk sac. Uh, the um, chorion ultimately becomes the placenta, the embryonic portion of the placenta. The amnion becomes the amniotic sac. Now, the amniotic sac, you may have heard uh, if a pregnant woman said that that her water broke, or if you've heard that term, that is the amniotic sac breaking. The amnion, fascinatingly, is an, an, an effort by terrestrial organisms to be able to lay their eggs on land. So it first developed in reptiles, what we would call reptiles, a long time ago. And what they did was they, instead of having to lay their eggs in water, they were able to, to encase their embryo in water and then encase that in a shell and lay their eggs on land. It, if you're living on land, it's a pain in the butt to have to go back to water all the time. You get a whole new class of predators in there that may uh, eat your, your babies. And then they have to metamorphose like uh, frogs and, and amphibians still do. So it's a much more um, effective method. Now we are descended directly from uh, a branch of reptiles and we have retained that uh, same sack of water. These, em these membranes over here are all homologous, which means they're all from the same evolutionary uh, um, source. So they're, they're the same, but they don't serve the f same functions anymore. You know, the yolk sac in a, in a chicken uh, is the food source, but in us, we make blood cells with it. The allantois, which is the waste sac in a chicken egg or a reptile egg, we use as our umbilical cord. Pretty cool. All right, uh, these primary germ layers. These are embryonic tissue layers. I don't know, the term primary germ layers is stuck around germinal tissues, so beginning tissues. Uh, three of them in at least us. So ectoderm, which, and, and by the way, look at this, this graphic down here. It's not completely accurate. It, it's gonna kind of leave some things out and maybe be too specific otherwise, but, uh, don't, uh, don't try to memorize that, that graphic. I just had space to fill, so I put it in. Uh, it's not mine. All right, so the ectoderm develops into your epidermis, which is your superficial layer of your skin, the linings of your opening, so your mouth, your nasal cavity, your uh, rectum, your vagina. Those are all derived from ectoderm. And interestingly, uh, so is your nervous system, right? Now, this is weird. Why all those, those superficial things and then your brain and spinal cord? Well, that's because of that process of neuralation. What you'll end up with is a little deal like this, where this, this invagination becomes the tube that becomes your spinal cord and your, and your brain. I'm sure that graphic doesn't help you at all. But mesoderm becomes most of you. Connective tissue, muscle, uh, lots. And if you think of connective tissue and muscle, that's bone, blood, uh, most of the tissue that makes up most of your organs. Uh, all of your skeletal muscles. So a vast majority of you is mesodermal. And the endoderm just forms some digestive and respiratory linings. So like your alveoli, uh, your alveolar cells, the columnar epithelium of your digestive system, some parts of your uh, urinary system and uh, endocrine system are also uh, endodermal. And then the last slide. Uh, keep in mind, I didn't cover every term in your lab book. I, I hit a bunch, but I'm not going to go in, in this PowerPoint. I'm not going to talk about sperm cells and a lot of, you know, other, I, I skipped a bunch of words. But those are all, you can find them all in the, in the other videos and in the, uh, in the photos mostly. So let's talk about fetal circulation. We'll hit some of the high points here. If you, you may have heard of a, a newborn being born with a hole in his, in his or her heart. Well, what that hole refers to is this right here. So I'm drawing a cross right there. I'll delete it here in a second. But that right here, 
my red ink is not doing me any credit. That's the foramen ovale. Now that's great. The foramen ovale and this thing, the ductus arteriosus, are extremely useful in a fetus that is submerged in amniotic fluid. So these lungs of this fetus have amniotic fluid in them. They're full of liquid. They're not doing any, they're not doing their job of, of oxygenating the blood before you're born. So you need a source of oxygen. And you get that from down here. That's the placenta, right? So the placenta uh, is an interface between the uh, fetus and the mother's um, systems. They don't, the mother's blood doesn't go directly into the fetus and vice versa, but that uh, oxygen and the nutrients get across via diffusion and waste products and CO2, uh, which is a waste product, get back across via diffusion. So the blood comes in through the umbilical vein, it's oxygenated, it goes, pa it passes this or passes through this tube called the ductus venosus, which connects to the inferior vena cava. So now we're here and we're bringing oxygenated blood into the, into the right atrium. So the right atrium as a fetus gets oxygenated blood, at least from the inferior portion. You can see up here, it's still deoxygenated coming from the head and shoulders, but this is why you wanna mix it. You wanna mix the left and right atria and you wanna mix the aorta and pulmonary artery because that way, all of the blood basically has the same oxygenation level. So you're gonna pump blood out of both ventricles to the body. The lungs in this case need oxygen, so they're getting oxygenated blood. And you do a little bit more, more mixing here at the, uh, at the ductus uh, arteriosus. Uh, those two structures become, after you're born, the fossa ovalis and the ligamentum arteriosum, respectively. That would be that shallow depression in between in your, uh, the wall of your atria. In the case of the fossa ovalis and the ligamentum arteriosum is a little ligament that holds the aorta and the pulmonary artery together. Okay, well, hope that was okay, and uh, we're almost through it, so stay with it.